Welcome to In The Zone, the podcast series from the Middle East Treaty Organization. I'm Anna Huta. And I'm Tony. After a summer break, we are back with more interesting interviews with people involved in the processes of eliminating weapons of mass destruction from the Middle East. In this interview, recorded during the Second World Peace Congress in Barcelona, hosted by the International Peace Bureau, we talked to Beatrice Finn, Executive Director of ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, and also the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, so thank you so much for letting us sit down with you for a few minutes. Um, to get into it, I think my first question would be that um, to do with the TPNW, hmm? um, the entry into force of the treaty was a huge achievement after decades of work by activists, academics, diplomats and friendly governments. And we were just wondering what the lessons are, in your opinion, that um, we've learned and we can apply to maybe achieving a WMD free zone in the Middle East. I think the, my main sort of lesson that I want to share with anyone working on the nuclear weapons issue, but also other issues, is kind of the power of doing stuff mm-hmm. and and moving forward. Right, like there's like um, you know a lot of people have criticized the TPNW for you know the stuff that it doesn't solve or oh, it doesn't it doesn't manage to do everything and oh you didn't get the support. But there is something powerful in just you know if we if we always went for everything perfect then we would not do anything and i think that you know doing what you can do right now mm-hmm. is always better than not doing it and i think that you know we've been very good within the whole i can kind of movement to to break it down into small pieces and and kind of promote that as very successful from the first humanitarian statements, for example, and like 16 countries said this, and then like 35 said this, and 120 said this, and the pledge that we had, or the humanitarian pledge, and kind of really small things that are, you know, not so small, but like just this, this, this kind of work. And I think that now, even when the treaty exists, you know, the way we work with cities, for example, like Barcelona, which kind of, you can, you can argue that, oh, it's not going to matter, right? The cities, cities don't have any power to change international law, but it matters because we make it matter. So I think it's, you know, my lesson is really to, to have that kind of, you know, to start doing things and celebrating when it goes well and like all the victories and see that as what you can do. What can I do today? And, and not get too preoccupied with in 30 years this and this and this is going to happen, but to like really just get on with some small stuff and make it big. Amazing. Great. And of course, all of the things that you mentioned that you have done have led to some incredible accomplishments and achievements, including the Nobel Peace Prize. And I was wondering what you would consider was good about getting the Nobel Peace Prize besides the obvious, mm-hmm. and if there were maybe any downsides to it. Aside from a really great party <laughs> and a lot of fun, uh, no, but it was an incredible recognition. And I think, as activists, we're so used to downplaying the importance of ourselves, right? And you know, we always are the ones with the smallest budgets, and you know, we do little tiny events, and maybe five people show up, or you know, it's just like it's hard work, and you kind of sign these petitions, and you do these small things, and it doesn't even matter. Is anyone ever going to notice it? So to be able to get that recognition. And hopefully, I, I hope that we also talk about it as in like sharing with others, like to every activist, you know, can kind of identify with us and feel like actually all of that work led to something, right? And it really means something and it really changes the world. Um, because very often these awards and the recognition goes to the head of state that signed the treaty and never to the tireless activists that like push them to the table. That's like my favorite thing to think about as a result of the, of the Nobel Peace Prize, that we could have like, you know, increased the status of being an activist, right? And, and, and making that a little bit exciting and feeling like you're, you know, that can actually lead to something rather than the kind of downplayed, oh, you're useless and nothing is going to happen. <laughs> well, I mean, we were always been the underdogs and to suddenly be put in a position of power is a little bit of a shift of perspective. And I still have to kind of think about stuff, you know, especially I love Twitter, you know, and I say mean things to people on Twitter sometimes. This idea that you always have to kind of punch up. Mm -hmm. So people who are more powerful than us, I feel like it's fair game, right, to be a bit, whereas people who are not, and with the Nobel Prize, that, that shifted a little bit, right? Like we got suddenly a platform and powerful, and then I had to just like personally, and I think everyone in the campaign had to kind of like figure out 
what do we do with this status? Like, do we behave different? Like, we still are us, but it also comes with a certain weight that, you know, maybe I, I mean, I still am me, but like, you know, yeah, I, it, it's, it's not easy always, right? And, and I remember been asked on like, having an opinion on things that I have no opinion about, mm -hmm. about different kind of human rights violations. And of course, at some point you will say, like, actually, I just do nuclear weapon stuff. I don't have yeah. something to say, but it also comes with a, a powerful thing, right? Like, we do need to speak up on other things as well, right? Because we have this position of authority now and we are Nobel Peace Prize laureate and we have to recognize um, conflicts and human rights violations and injustice and other things. So it's a bit of a balance there, really. Brilliant. Okay. And in terms of looking to the future, what is the current goal for ICANN in terms of the numbers of states? And do you think there's a critical mass number or a specific goal that you have in mind that might then pressure the nuclear arms states to kind of get involved with um, ICANN's work and to disarm? And how do you imagine that we might be able to get the nuclear arms states to join the TPNW? I don't know if there's a critical mass, like a, a number. I think it's it's already working. It's already having an impact, right? And each one will make it stronger uh, rather than a specific bar. So I think it's more, and it also depends on what we do about it. I think this is also one of the things I've learned, like how power and influence is so abstract and not, it, it just exists or not. And it only exists if you believe in it. Someone only has influence if you believe it, that they have influence. Uh, and if other people believe that they have influence and that kind of thing. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of this is in our hands, right? What we do with it. But of course, I mean, we want every country to join. I mean, um, we definitely, our next goal is 100. I mean, first it was 50, now it's 100, then we'll be 150, and then we'll be 200. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, of, of course we want to reach 100, but I think every country that joins is going to make it uh, more powerful. And I think in terms of when it's going to have an impact on the nuclear arms, it's, again, like, I think it has already. Uh, it needs more, of course, because we're not seeing the policy changes yet. But I think that we have shifted the debate. Uh, we have moved forward the kind of demands on the nuclear arms states. Uh, I think we've definitely put a lot of pressure on NATO states, right? The countries who used to come, used to say that we are, we are the good guys. And then now it turns out they're not the good guys, actually. And I think this is something we see in all issues, right? In climate change, in racism, in gender, like, oh, don't, don't, don't attack me. I'm one of the good ones. Uh, I mean, it's a very, this kind of privileged, um, moderate in between. Um, and I think that we've exposed so much in other issues, that problematic role and how that is protecting the people who are even worse. I think that's one of the main strengths of the TPNW is that it really puts a spotlight on a country like Spain, on a country like Norway, Germany, like, uh-uh, you talk about your humanitarian stuff and how good you are. No, you are prepared to mass murder civilians with weapons of mass destruction. And you, either you own that or you change that. Um, so I think that's really something we're already seeing working. Yeah, amazing. And as you mentioned, um, for example, race and talking a little bit about accountability, meaningful change, um, I can recently authored a report on race, colonialism and nuclear weapons, which was brilliant to see, especially from an organisation that is at the forefront of campaigns work. And it must have involved a great deal of personal reflection by those who authored it. Um, what impact has that had on the decision making bodies within ICANN? I think this is a, a really interesting issue, right? The, the kind of looking at colonialism, looking at racism in terms of nuclear weapons. It's tricky. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there's several different aspects and we are in a bit of a, you know, in, in a position where we have a global membership, right? And we have worked very hard in, in kind of promoting non-Western countries, both in terms of like leadership in the treaty on the diplomatic level, but also within ICANN and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then there was this whole, you know, the racism conversation wasn't new, of course, but with the murder of George Floyd, it became a, a huge sort of reflection internally, and particularly from the US, I think it was like, it started there, this, this conversation less of the colonial and more of the kind of racism within structures. So I think those two, that we have been extremely comfortable and I think proactive throughout camp, uh, ICANN about the colonialism and the kind of developed countries versus global south, uh, promoting countries from the Pacific, from Africa as leaders on this issue, and much less 
naturally because we are still like we're located in Geneva, the headquarters. We are still a predominantly white staff team in a way. I think that that kind of like yeah, the conversation there was much more. Oh yeah, we have some internal work yeah. to do as well. And those two things, just because we're talking about this, does not mean that we're doing this well. So I think that's a, a, a really genuine process from our side into into thinking. I think the pandemic as well has really opened up for really great opportunities, right? To hire people from anywhere. Like this idea that you have to be based in Geneva, like, no, you don't actually and anymore. And, or maybe never, of course. But so I think that that also opens up a, a lot of really great opportunities in terms of our future recruitments, uh, looking at where we kind of can hire people, who do we value. Um, I'm really, this is something that I think is, is so relevant because the way you see this issue and the way that I thought the gender was relevant for this as well. I think that the racism angle is so ingrained in nuclear weapons and it's not really talked about too much. I think that that's why a lot of our partner organizations uh, and a lot of the different people who are involved, I can very much wanted to work on this paper and wanted to put this out. I think it's not a conversation that is nowhere near concluded or finished. Mm -hmm. We want to do more stuff. We want to engage with um, more people and I think that digging a little bit into the first internal reflections but also the kind of colonial reflections and I think that we've had some interesting conversations between internally between uh, some of our African partner organizations perspective on racism and some of our uh, kind of American who their perspective on racism and not at all similar perspective right it's Hard to say anything definite on this uh, or conclusive, but I think it's just extremely important, right? And it's something that I think can really help get people to understand nuclear weapons for what they are. Really? The white person, right? It's always very intimidating talking about these things. Um, but I've always like we tried to made a commitment in ICANN that we will just we, we say things, right, and not be afraid yeah. mm -hmm. of saying things because being afraid of doing something on this issue. Yeah. is worse mm. rather than doing something wrong, I think. From ICANN's point of view, how are you seeing the development of um, the TPNW in the Middle East and North Africa mm. region? What are you hearing from, from governments? Uh, we've struggled with that region um, and have felt a little bit that it's, uh, it's, it's something that we need to approach as a whole, like the region uh, rather than individual countries. I mean, some countries I think could be open to it. Um, we of course have uh, some North African countries that, that are in the process of, of joining. But uh, the issue of Israel keeps coming up for many, like for example, Egypt, who is oh, very super supportive, but we're not signing any more treaties until Israel does. And then boom, no more discussion. Uh, I think, of course, I mean, to me, the, the treaty is an ex a, you know, a really good way of putting more pressure on Israel uh, and to really kind of um, not see nuclear weapons as this kind of balance thing. But like, it's, it doesn't matter who has them. It's, it's unacceptable. Um, so I think it would be really helpful. I think we need to put some more effort into it. I think we need, what we've tried to do now is to... Uh, really focus on the countries that are supportive and just hasn't had the priority right to do it like a lot of african countries for example right now and uh, we have two two kind of regions that we think about the central asia region mm -hmm. and the middle east as countries that we need to tackle as groups a little bit more so i would love to do more advocacy and outreach to in that region um in the coming years i think that's something that is definitely a priority for us uh, and i think that they will play a really big role in the future success of the treaty We've been we're starting to talk about how we need to we need to have a, a part of our strategy which is also focusing on the survivors because mm. there's chemical weapon survivors. Yeah. There are the Algerian yeah. Te uh, yeah. you know, nuclear yeah. test victims. <gasps> yeah. There's Iranian Iran Iraq war. You know, there's yeah. chemical weapon survivors. And so we're going to try and develop I more. That, yeah, I think that's that's really uh, narrative. the and I'm I'm really fascinated with chemical weapons. It's something that I. Um, have been thinking about it. also now that the treaty is in force how we can make like create better ties with the chemical weapons convention and the biological weapons convention because we of course talk a lot about the lamas and custom nations as models for us but 
uh, and that is of course because of the humanitarian disarmament approach to things but I do think that there is the WMD three WMD bands right like it's it's uh, it's also a so a place where we need to do work I think and to and to really look at the I mean, like the chemical weapons used in Syria, for example, and the the impact there, and see that as a bigger part of like we need to make sure that we don't get lazy around weapons of mass destruction, right? Like that, that just because we've had some of these treaties a long time, this one is new, of course. But um, yeah, and and to maybe infuse a bit of humanitarian disarmament into those, even though they already have treaties, they might need some of this kind of narrative around it. And of course, you know the. There's racism in there as well. You know, mm. They don't get the they, they don't get the media attention because yeah. you know, they're in the middle of places yeah. where no one yeah. cares about. Them. So I think it's find it very interesting this this mm. work of connecting the, yeah. the racism and the colonialism. And the, yeah. The I mean, I see it so obvious in the way that I mean, I, yeah, in, in the way that like we talk about who's important and who's not important yeah. and but even also i think it is so much interesting things to be done i think around this dynamic between the us and china now and the kind of kind of straightforward like asian hate right mm -hmm. like yeah. and 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 this or like this like they are up to something over mm -hmm. i mean like a very hostile rhetoric around China in this very similar to how people were speaking about Japan mm -hmm. in World War Two, and I think that's there is something there that I think should be done more research on and discuss about. And I know that there are some um, Chinese American uh, activists that have thought, talked about this and, and seen like this kind of new rhetoric against China as the big threat as also a legitimization of hatred towards Asians mm -hmm. uh, and kind of and I think that there's there's connections there definitely um, and the way we talk about India and Pakistan's mm -hmm. nuclear weapons program for example as much more dangerous than anyone else's and I'm not advocating that more countries should have nuclear weapons rather the opposite but you know what I mean like there's like a built-in idea that white countries are more responsible yeah. um, I think that yeah. the, the stories around the South Africa's disarmament program that we like to think of, you know, well, they changed from apartheid to a democracy and thereby gave up their nuclear weapons. But it was the apartheid regime who knew they had to give up power and were not comfortable with a black led nuclear armed state mm -hmm. and make sure that they gave it up so that a black country wouldn't have it was the apartheid regime who like decided before they handed over power we need to get rid of this because we cannot have an anc red led mm -hmm. government who is like an african yeah. and what that says about the parallels of like power and like who has the right to mm. increase yeah. mm. no i think it's very um very interesting right and it's something there that i think we need to talk more about and we need to learn more about um challenge ourselves and our perceptions. I mean, that's also part of it, right? There's a dynamic in, in I, also within ICANN, right? Is it a bigger victory to get Norway to be an observer state than getting DRC to confirm that they're going to be an observer state? I mean, in a way, no matter what the skin color is, like DRC is actually supports the treaty and is about to sign and ratify. So it's not a big change. I mean, Norway is actually a political battle we fought and we won. So yes, in one way, but are we contributing to making this them look special when they might not? I, I don't know. Beatrice, thank you very much. Thank you so I think much. That thank was, you. That was a really nice conversation. <laughs>everyone who's tuned in for another episode of In The Zone. You can find us online at www.wmd-free.me where you can subscribe to our newsletter, donate money or even volunteer to work with us. Just a reminder that we're also on social media. We have accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn and you can find our podcasts on SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube. See you next time.